Chapter 18 Wrong Feeding the Prime Cause of Diseases In the little book entitled Britain's Health, prepared by S. Mervyn Herbert, we read the following relative to nutrition. Under quotes, Recent scientific investigations indicate that it is all important in national health and that the provision of adequate nourishment for every man, woman and child in the community should go hand in hand with the most elementary environmental services such as sanitation, housing and the provision of pure water. Vitamins are now a commonplace and from their study has developed a new conception of food values. It has been shown that the incidence of tuberculosis realized that they may eat as much as they can and still be suffering from malnutrition if the food they choose lacks the important protective elements. Nearly everywhere in the tropics can be found appalling cases of scurvy, pellagra or beriberi which have developed not from starvation but from lack of vitamins and minerals. Closed quotes. I should have said and instead of or. It has been known that the incidence of tuberculosis rose in all the countries which had suffered from food shortage during the Great War, 1914 to 1918. Open quotes. The incidence of malnutrition in Britain cannot be described with accuracy, but authorities on diet are agreed that it is sufficiently extensive to constitute the most serious danger to health at the present time. Lack of money is unquestionably responsible for a large part of malnutrition, but a good deal is due to the ignorance which results in certain foods of low nutritive value being consumed in excess. Closed quotes. Precisely, all of which can be reduced to one sentence. Open quotes. The prime cause of disease is the absence of substances which should be in the body and the presence of substances which should not be in the body. Closed quotes. Doctors, Disease and Health by Cyril Scott. The gist of it has been put even more tersely by Major C. Fraser McKenzie, CIE, with open quotes, We are made of what we eat, so if any organ becomes diseased, it generally means the food was wrong. Closed quotes. Reduced to even still further conciseness, the cause of disease is an ill-balanced diet. Yet, provided this is kept in mind, it is an unwise procedure to lay down any specific rules anent what precise foods people should or should not eat. For climate, environment, and personal idiosyncrasies, under quotes, have to be taken into account. The Eskimos cannot be expected to live on the same elements as the Brazilians, for example. As to personal idiosyncrasies, they are numerous and some of them very peculiar. The case could be mentioned of a man to whom fish is so violent a poison that even if he licks a postage stamp, the sticky side contains fish glue, his whole face swells up to such an extent that he cannot see out of his eyes. There are also persons to whom eggs in any form whatsoever are poison. Yet sometimes such persons grow out of these peculiarities. The writer knows of a woman who could not touch an egg, whether by herself or in a pudding or a cake, until she had turned 70, and then, strange to say, eggs ceased to disagree with her. Rabid vegetarians, as we know, would have us believe that meat-eating is virtually the cause of all human ills. I differ from them entirely, on the best of all grounds, personal experience, and what I have observed in others. If vegetarians had declared that a meatless diet would be the best regime for everybody, if for years man had not acquired the food habits of an omnivorous animal, then I would agree with them. But as it is, my observations have taught me that sudden changes of diet from zoophagus to meatless can have disastrous results. In short, the average man has not as yet attend to that state of health when he is ready for complete vegetarianism, however desirable this may be as an ideal. Nevertheless, I will make the following reservation. It may be different with persons who have been brought up from infancy on a meatless diet, provided that diet is not merely meatless. That is, it must be a well-balanced vegetarian dietary and not just an excess of undercourse starchy rubbish. After all this, it will now be asked what sort of a diet do I personally advocate in general for people living in the temperate zones? My answer is a dietary consisting of a proper proportion of meat, poultry, eggs, fish, salads, steamed vegetables, whole wheat, bread, fresh fruits in season, brown unpolished rice, butter in moderation, and honey, which is the best sweetening agent there is. To be avoided are all tinned foods twice cooked foods, all processed denatured foods such as white bread, white sugar, polished rice and pasteurized milk. Condiments should also be avoided. In my opinion, tinned meats, processed foods and pasteurized milk are the evil. 
commercial products of what we are pleased to call civilization. White sugar and white bread are simply invented to put money into the hands of respectively the sugar refiners and the flour refiners. White sugar is merely an acid producing element seeing that all the alkaline properties have been refined out of it. Last century an unscrupulous doctor was paid to declare that he had found a bug in brown sugar and therefore it was unfit for human consumption in its natural state. See McCann's Science of Eating. As to pasteurized milk, Dr. Mary Stopes is not the only one who has forcibly condemned it. She calls it, as we have seen, that foul poison. Under quotes. This may be going a bit too far, but the fact remains that the pasteurization of milk, apart from other considerations, enables it to be sold when it is not fresh. Its lack of freshness not being detectable as it would be with unpasteurized milk. Which reminds me that the late Mr. F. A. McQuiston, K.C. M.P., said of the commodity. Viz. Some people think pasteurized milk is milk from the pasture. It is nothing but half-boiled milk lacking in nourishment. If you give it to calves, they die. If you give it to rats, they fail to reproduce their species. It is a form of birth control. Under quotes. Daily Mirror, March 2, 1940. There is no doubt that as regards dietetics, whether the doctors admit it or not, we owe a great deal to the naturopaths who first drew attention to the necessity of eating vital foods. Hence the subsequently coined word vitamins. But unfortunately these have been exploited commercially and artificial vitamins are now on the market. Against this, Professor A.J. Clark of the University of Edinburgh warned the public. In fact, number 14, he wrote in effect that the chief education the public is receiving is, under quotes, in the form of advertisements of proprietary vitamin preparations, tonic foods, etc., which distort the facts in any manner that the advisors fancy will sell their preparations. Closed quotes. We should obtain our vitamins, he declared, from a properly regulated diet and not from so-called tonic food preparations. Needless to say, I heartily agree with this dictum. I also agree with much that the naturopaths have put forward, though on one or two points I differ from them materially. There have been a few extremists who have wished to eliminate starch and sugar from the dietary altogether. This is a dangerous fallacy. No one can subsist for long without some sugar and starch in the organism. It is an excess of starch which is evil, as I pointed out in my chapter on the common cold. And now, if the cause of disease has become obvious, so also must be its prevention. A well-regulated diet, which of course means neither too little nor too much, to which dictum I would add plus an occasional fast according to my particular method. Furthermore, I would advocate the habitual intake of one's own fresh urine. On rising, a glass full should be taken, and again, a glass full during the day. For my own part, I drink all that I pass, and apart from fresh milk, drink no other beverage, but then I am an enthusiast. Were I to lay down the law, under quotes, too forcibly for all and sundry, I should also be termed as a dogmatist. It might likewise savor of the dogmatic if I were to say that one meal a day or two at most are sufficient for the maintenance of health and strength. Yet in my own case, I have found in the end that one meal suffices me. This is to say, however, whether it sounds dogmatic or not, namely that all violent and sudden alterations in diet are only wise if undertaken after a fast. People who for humanitarian reasons have suddenly taken to vegetarianism have frequently had to suffer for their high-mindedness. Nature objects to sudden changes of this kind. Conversely, people who have found that vegetarianism disagrees with them and then have suddenly taken to flesh foods have also had to pay for their policy. But not so if they have made the change after a urine fast, the length of which has been regulated according to their condition and the nature, though not the name, of their malady. And here let me add a word to this chapter regarding the enforced fasts of survivors in open boats who when faced with a deficiency of water eventually resort to drinking their own urine. A correspondent has objectingly written to me saying that there are a number of cases on records of sailors who have drunk their own urine when adrift at sea and have died in consequence. But surely the writer is confounding effect and cause, nor does his deduction tally with the admiralty's admission that, under quotes, the practice is harmless. Closed quotes. The truth is that these unfortunate men had in all likelihood only started to drink their urine when in extremis. Had they started to take it from the first, they would have modified their actual sufferings from food and water starvation. But of course in such cases one has to take into account the bad effects of exposure and the constant anxiety that attends such horrible experiences. 
Unfortunates who are cast adrift in a boat are, needless to say, continually harassed by the idea that they are going to perish from hunger and thirst. Could they be freed from this idea and at the same time assured that urine drinking is not only harmless but actually beneficial, the experience would hold for them less terrors. If it was generally known that a man can subsist for what may seem to be the uninitiated and extraordinary long time on urine only, the knowledge would prove of enormous value against the debilitating effects of fear thoughts. I may mention that the longest fast I can record was that of a man who fasted 101 days for blindness brought about by a sting in one eye and the long continued use of atrophin in both. But such a lengthy fast would not have been feasible without the urine rubbings in addition to the urine intake which plays so important a part in urine therapy. therapy.